Bravery seems to be a theme today, and it was a theme yesterday with the pile of middle school students that we had lined up to come up here on stage while well, all the speakers were over here wringing our hands and sweating profusely, so they put me to shame. We're going to talk a little bit about resiliency and what it takes to find that bravery within everyone, um, because it's there. But somewhere between middle school and them wanting to walk up here and when we become adults, it goes away. So how do we stay brave? I'm going to tell a little bit about my story. Um, I am the daughter of immigrants. My parents moved here in the 60s from Haiti, which is a little poor country in the Caribbean, just south of Florida, kind of around Jamaica and Cuba. And they came here by choice. Uh, they decided they wanted something different. They met here, uh, bought cool American stuff like cars and clothes and food. Um, so they really enjoyed being here. They met, they got married, they had kids. My mother had this view growing up. Um, which is awesome, but when you're hungry, it's not that cool. My father left, um, I suspect, because of this man, my grandfather, who is not the happiest looking man ever. Um, a lot of my friends used to talk about their grandpops or their poppies or whatever, and they had candy and money in their pockets. My grandfather was full of comments like, what's wrong with you? Okay. He was my first introduction to work ethic. He came to visit, and I was, I think, eight or nine years old. He came to visit, stayed for dinner, and my job was to make a green salad, just lettuce, you know, tomato, cucumber, whatever. Well, I'm eight years old, I'm lazy, I don't want to do it, so I just took the big leaves off and put them in a bowl, and my grandfather wore dentures, and he didn't have the polydent in, so him trying to eat big leaves of lettuce wasn't going over very well. So he took me by the ear and dragged me back into the kitchen. And he said, you're going to stand here for the next two hours, and you're going to cut heads of lettuce. And he sent my father out to go get more lettuce, and I sat there and cut lettuce into little three-inch by three-inch squares. I remember turning to him and saying, but I'm only eight years old. And he looked at his watch, and he said, somewhere in Port-au-Prince right now, one of your cousins is working in a field, and they're eight years old. I don't want to hear any excuses. And that's where my path started about not making any excuses for myself. My parents, you know, did well for themselves, um, got jobs, we got a bigger house. My father always took pride in our home. Every Saturday he was out there cutting the grass, making sure the gutters were clean, painting, upkeeping, making sure that our property value stayed up there with our neighbors. While his kids, on the other hand, were inside during housekeeping day, taking all shortcuts possible. My favorite shortcut was vacuuming, because we hated it. It was 300-pound Hoover that we'd drive around the house. So what we used to do instead was plug it in and then get a hanger and then drag the hanger across the carpet <laughs> because it looked like a vacuum. Then it dawned on us that we had to draw a line in between the vet because there were two rotors and it had to look right. That was about three hours worth of work that we could have gotten done in, what, 30 minutes between the three of us? But we were always looking for shortcuts. And my parents were always telling us that we were spoiled and unappreciative and lazy and we we're like, what? No, I vacuumed. So we heard stories all the time about these kids back in Haiti and how they were suffering and they had to go to school uphill both ways. And we thought that was just, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. Until we actually visited. There are hills up ways both ways to school. There was no hot lunch. There was no air conditioning. So we spent some time in classrooms that looked like this. And then suddenly we had a deep-seated appreciation for America. Okay. At that point, we also understood that it was time to work a little bit harder and to actually show our parents that we were thankful that they moved here and prayed they never sent us back there for summer vacation. So this was me in eighth grade. I got, no, not all, I got teased a lot, okay? But one of the things that my parents instilled with me, and it started with that conversation with my grandfather, was that, you know what, when you get teased, how do you handle it? This whole concept of mean girls, it's been around, you guys know that, for a very, very long time. But what resiliencies are we putting in place with our children to make sure that they can handle it? So when a girl would walk up to me and say, oh, I don't like your outfit today. Now, mind you, I went to Catholic school, so we all wore the same outfit, so. 
my response was always, well, I'm sorry, but this is what I'm wearing. <laughs> well, we don't like you because of your shoes. I really don't care. Our kids have to learn to be able to say, I don't care, and know when to be able to say that. To any one of you, I could walk up and say, I don't like your sweater. And you should really say, sorry, I don't care. <laughs> so along with resiliency comes that effort, like we said, to be brave. This is my eighth grade report card. If you notice, back in the day, way back when, 70s and 80s, they used to handwrite our report card, remember? Well, I decided, and you know, my household was a straight A household. Back then, it was ones instead of As and twos instead of Bs. I decided that I didn't like the fact that I got a two, I think, in science lab. So what did I do? Because I'm so smart. I'm going to change the grade. <laughs> Am I going to find a pen that matches what Sister Julianne had put? No. So I took a felt tip, and I changed that too. And then it dawned on me, OK, this isn't looking right. So what do most eighth graders do? I'm going to hide it and pretend it never happened. Now, the problem is my brothers went to the same school, so I had to convince them to do the exact same thing. So bribery, threats, coercion, mob style, you know. I tore up a part of the carpet in the living room. I buried it underneath, forgot all about it. My dad stopped asking. Two weeks later, I'm out on the playground, hanging out with my girls. And I look up, and I see my dad's car pulling away from the parking lot. And I thought, the jig is up, and I threw up right there. <laughs> my parents say that they weren't upset about me changing the grade, which is a lie. They were upset that I convinced my brothers to lie along with me. The coercion. The fact that I didn't have enough character to stand up and say, OK, listen, I got a two, and this is what I did, and so you know, punish me as you will. What, what, eight, what eighth grader is going to say that? And if you notice, in the fourth quarter, I did it again. <laughs> I did it again. I had some one minuses. I put a plus. How easy is that? <laughs> I got in trouble again, and I said, but I didn't lie this time. They said, yeah, but you're a cheat and a fraud. <laughs> Truth. And that's a big piece of what we have to hear, is more truth. This is my kid brother, and we're close. And we did a lot of truth telling with each other. You know, a lot of name calling, a lot of fighting. Lot of... You have to surround yourself with people that are honest with you. Granted, yes, it's nice to have that entourage of people that tell you how wonderful you are. But every now and again, you need that person that's going to say to you, you know what, something's wrong with you. Okay? <laughs> one, of my, one of my best friends came to me a few months back. She was you know, at her job, and she's kind of lazy, and she doesn't do what she's supposed to do, blah, blah, blah. And she said, you know, I hate my job, and they're not doing this, they're not listening to me, and that my boss really doesn't like me, and I think it's because I'm black. And I said, no, it's because you're a moron. <laughs> that has nothing to do with it. And my, I have a 14-year-old and a 17-year-old. My 14-year-old has used that with me before. My teacher doesn't like me. Why? Because, you know, I think it's because I'm black. Really? Did you do the assignment? No. Well. Moron. <laughs> so my brother and I have always held that truth. And he was dorky, had you know, astigmatism and buck teeth and asthma. So when he'd watch television, and I think he was also had a hearing issue in one eye. So my, he used to, <laughs> or one ear, I'm sorry. He used, to, <laughs> he used to drive my father nuts because as we're watching TV, we watch family classics every Sunday. And he'd be sitting there on the couch like this. But I always defended him. I adored him. And now, now, we have that healthy sense of competition with each other. And now his face is plastered on billboards in LA. He is the vice president and CIO for Toyota. Okay? So for my mom, I, for Christmas, I give her you know, hand-woven bookmarks from Ecuador, and he gets her you know, cars. <laughs> it makes me look stupid. And here's the irony. Here's the irony. I gave a similar you know, talk yesterday. I'm out there, and I'm meeting with some of the kids, and some teachers come up to me, and they say to me, we loved your talk. It was great. Da, da, da. You know, we've got this thing coming up at one of the high schools. Um, it's in February. You know, could you really see if your brother could come speak? <laughs> He's a moron. No. So we all have to find our, ourselves and find that truth. And I have that truth. I have that person in my life, my family, but I also have my best friend, my best friend who will always tell me that I'm doing something wrong or not on the right path. 
This is the same person who one day I decided I was going to go on Atkins, right, which is all protein, boiled eggs, da 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 da. Well, I decided to stay on Atkins while having the flu. And then I went to go visit her office one day. And when you throw up boiled eggs in someone's trash can, and they call you an idiot, that's love. <laughs> that's love. Finding our inner strength also comes from being able to know what you can control and what you can't. About five or six years ago, I had what's called, it's called a bad grape year, if we were a vineyard, okay? Things just, things weren't going well for me at all. Work, you know, aggravating kids, aggravating husband, aggravating. Um, and I got sick. And it was one of those illnesses where, you know, go to the doctor, go to the doctor, they try treatment, they try this, they try that, they try that nothing works. So after about a year of that, they said, okay, we're going to have to put you up on the rack and stuff's going to have to come out and blah, blah, blah. It's going to change the course of some of the things you're going to be able to do in your life. And I whined and I complained. And why me? It's a conspiracy. They're out to get me. Blah, 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 blah. After that happened and I healed and I got better, I continued to whine. I still wasn't happy. I was alive. I was doing well. I was healthy. While on 6th Street in Austin, and this was a complete, you know, diversion from the normal me, I decided to get a tattoo, which already upset my mom that I have dreadlocks. You know, that should have been enough. But I went and got this tattoo, and I decided not to get something whimsical or, you know, the, the pink ribbon or anything like that. I got my maiden name tattooed on my wrist. My maiden name in French uh, is Guerrier for warrior. And I decided that I was going to put it somewhere where I could see it every day. And most people, when they get their first tattoo, they hide it somewhere and everything else. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to make this mine. So that every morning when I got up, I put a bracelet on over that tattoo. Okay. And I'm not hiding it, but it's mine. And that tattoo reminded me of Wonder Woman growing up. She had her bracelets. And this makes me stronger. It's also on my right hand because you know what? My power lies within my right hand. I'm the one who can make the decisions and make the choices to alter the course of things and how they go. I don't have to accept all the bad things that might happen to me. I can make a decision. I can write something down. I can move it forward. And that's the same thing that I work on every day to teach our children to move it forward. I don't advocate for my children. I push them to advocate for themselves. When my son gets a bad grade, I tell him, did you study? Did you do your homework? Well, yeah. Did you really? And I push him forward, and he has to go argue that grade with his teacher. The same thing with my seven-year-old. I'm only seven. Somewhere on the planet, there's a seven-year-old doing something a lot harder than what you're doing right now. So push yourselves. Surround yourself with people who are better than you, that are stronger than you. And that will help propel you forward. Thank you.